back. Um, this time around, we'll be having Bill and the scene. Bill, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Good. So, um, Bill will be talking to us this afternoon, and um, he will be talking about marketing automation, a view from the consulting trenches. Yep. All right. So, um, let me quickly introduce Bill to us. So, Bill is a marketing technology solution architect whose um, clients include Fidelity Investment, Rapid7, Veeam, Vidyard, and others. In addition to consulting, Bill is the founder and trainer for the Marketing Technology Council, helping people enter the marketing. Uh, I don't know if I just lost you, but I think we're ready to go. So let's make sure that you can see me. All right, so um, everybody, welcome Bill. And um, Bill will be taking us through um, the journey as he'll be talking about the consulting trenches. All right, Bill, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you see my slides okay right now? Okay. Yes. So um, I, I'm Bill Anderson. I work, I'm a professional consultant at a consultancy. Um, and what we'll talk about today is um, I work with companies around the world and um, mostly it's technology, software, financial services industries. Um, the, the, the companies that I generally work with are small to medium sized enterprise. And so my talk will be mostly focused on the corporate environment, um, particularly with about a few hundred employees or more. Um, what I find is some companies are extremely well run. Some companies have created very complicated systems that are really hard to maintain. And uh, really what I see is there's, I see some common threads throughout this that I'd like to share with you today. This is a very high level talk. Uh, there's not too many pretty pictures in here, but what I'll be talking about is consulting, a bit about company politics uh, and building automation platforms in general. I tend to speak really quickly and I get enthusiastic, so I speed up. So I really hope that you will have uh, questions for me in the end. I'll probably leave too much time uh, for questions because I sped through my slides. So I'll do my best not only to slow down and speak clearly, but also uh, to leave time for your questions. Have you ever seen this? I get this a lot and I see this a lot. Um, we're sorry, oops, there are things that, you know, there are emails that are sent that uh, they went out with mistakes, they went out with personalization mistakes, uh, the wrong emails go to the wrong senders. And many times what you'll get is you have a follow-up email that says, we're sorry you received uh, an, an email that we had not intended and here is a coupon for 20% off. Um, and so this is really important here because the first thing that I want to talk about is slow down. Uh, in a lot of disciplines, practitioners will often mistake speed for competence. I see this quite a bit with web designers and graphic designers, particularly people who are early in their career. What happens is they equate speed to uh, to, to being a good designer. And that's actually, so what they'll do is you'll give them a project, they turn it around in a few hours. And then the next thing you know, there's revision after revision because they didn't quite get it. Uh, I, I myself came from a design background, so I'm guilty of this. It's not that I'm singling anyone out. It's simply a fact and I see this on a regular basis. Um, you know, inattention creates disasters. Um, and you see that, you know, you see that pretty often. Email is not really easy and cheap. And if you make a mistake, it can be quite expensive. It can also be quite embarrassing for companies as well. So what I like to think about is approach this as if you were printing $250,000 hard, 250,000 hard copy books. Now, if you think about that, 250,000 books when it goes to a printing press, that's 
$10 per bound book. Uh, that is two million five, two two and a half million dollars. That's on press at the time, and it's something that um, uh, you know you can't afford to make mistakes at that point. So you can be sure that people are scrutinizing every piece of the the book. They're looking at every page. They're reading it backwards so that they make sure that there are no typos. They're making sure that the pages are in order. You need to do the same thing when you're approaching emails because you're sending out to databases of you know, 20,000, 30,000, 50, 200, 500,000 people or more. And those mistakes get to be pretty big pretty quickly. So that I suggest that you take quite good care in, in uh, keeping that in mind and we'll talk about how to do that. My rule that I teach students is uh, particularly with marketing automation, it's communicate, document, and then execute. Uh, you need to communicate and learn what clients really need. Um, you need to document and get sign off on the concepts and all of the assets that you need to produce before you start coding. Okay, because and that's really what we're doing. We're doing drag and drop coding and or, you know programming in many cases. You're, when you're building a list, you're building an algorithm. Right, so take the careful approach of a programmer and think about that. And then when you do document the client decisions, you want to document that in a central repository so that it can't be modified or edited. Um, great examples of project management tools are Mavenlink, Rike, Basecamp, Asana. Those tools allow you to continuously be uh, updating your documentation as you go. You really need to do this. Communicate, document, then execute. Don't jump past the other points or you'll have a disaster. Define success before you start. I strongly re recommend this book, Strategic Project Management Made Simple. Um, it's written by a NASA project manager. And one of the things that he talks about is having the end goal in mind so defining what makes a what makes the the success of a project before you even begin nasa has a rule they have a, a list of 100 rules for project managers that they've learned over time and rule 15 states the seeds of a problem were laid down early disasters were well planned from the start because people weren't focusing on success they were focusing on their technical piece, or they were focusing on some workflow or some some troublesome problem that they had, and they lost track of the, the end goal. They've lost track of, you know, what makes success. And uh, if you think about athletes, athletes need to know the rules of the game in order to win. And if the rules change mid-play, then there's chaos. And you can see that happen in a corporate environment because if you don't know what success looks like to a client, you can never prove value. So you need to sit down with your clients and truly figure out what is important to them. Because if they don't know what success is, and, and a lot of them will try to skip over this because they haven't done the hard thinking that they need to do in order to uh, define success. And they'll just say, oh, you know, we just got to get this stuff done. Well, you'll never be a You'll never prove your value to them if you can't um, if you can't say, okay, you told me this is your success. This is the things that I've done to achieve this. So I strongly suggest you sit down and figure that out with your client before you really begin. Ask clarifying questions as you talk through with the client. <clears throat> Excuse me. Don't assume that you understand what they say. You need to repeat back what you heard in your own words. So think about it. The client says to you, blah, 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 blah. And then you say, well, um, so I heard you say, did I get this right? I heard you say, blah, 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 blah. And then they would come back and say, well, actually, no, it's a little bit different. It's really blah, 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 blah. And at that point, you've come to a definition of what they said. You understand it. They understand it and then you document that, okay? This is really crucial that you feed the information back to them. I find on a regular basis, I would say probably 
30 or 40 percent of the time when I'm discussing a project with a client, I didn't actually understand what they wanted. I heard something that was close, but I missed some nuance. So repeating back to them in their in your own words, what they just said will help you do that. And then after the meeting, you may still have questions. You know, don't don't forget about this. Just ask anyway. But if you do ask those questions, you want to make a list of those questions, sort them logically, and then send it to the client one time. You don't want to be peppering the client with uh, with questions as you go through because then you look, it's annoying for them. It's disruptive to their workflow, and you look scattered. Okay. So if it's not in writing, it never happened. Now, when I talk about it, I say communicate. We just talked about communication, document. You need to document all of your decisions. This is critical as a consultant. Um, this is make or break for you. Document your meetings, document any decisions, document all the next steps. Um, this is super important. Um, I have I have something that I, I have a story that I want to tell you here. Um, when I have a client that is still my client, I've had a client for a few years now, they needed to reduce their database size. Um, I offered them best practices in Salesforce on how to reduce their database size. Uh, unfortunately, they needed a quick fix. They wanted a quick fix. They knew it was dangerous, but for political reasons, they weren't able to do um, some of the best practices. It often happens in bigger corporations that, you know, Salesforce is siloed. They're they're completely independent of, you know, the marketing automation platform. So they don't they don't talk to each other, or you have to get into their Scrum, and you have to, you know they're in a backlog, and so it can take weeks or even months to get any changes done. So many times, clients will try to get workarounds. Um, so throughout the, the throughout a discussion that lasted several months, I uh, I really told them that this is what they wanted to do was quite dangerous, um, and I documented every step of the way. I documented my meeting notes when we had emails, uh, and I clarified questions for them. I would add that email to uh, to Basecamp, <clears throat> and in doing so, I created this list of. Um, List of a rolling list of documentation. Well, what happened was a new person came in and they thought that they were running a report, but they actually ran a rough and untested program that was set up to see how many people would be deleted. And it wasn't configured properly. Um, and he ran this on a Friday afternoon and more than a million records were deleted. It ran over the weekend, it ran into Monday, it ran into Tuesday. And not only did it delete over a million, I think it was close to a million and a half records from within the marketing automation database, but then it reached in and it started to delete all of those leads from Salesforce. It was deleting true customers. It was deleting prospects, it was deleting uh, prospects. It was deleting contacts where salespeople had an active deal that they were working on, and they were finishing a proposal, and those people just disappeared, uh, and all of the all of the stuff just came crashing down. Um, and the client was very gracious, and they said, "You know, Bill, you you told us about this. You you know, and and we had a list. I had all that documentation there that showed them. I." I talked to you about this three months ago. I told you this was a bad idea. Now, this is a terrible story, but uh, and I fortunately had an extremely good partner on their side that, that uh, you know, accepted, accepted responsibility and we worked through this. But if it wasn't documented, there could have very easily been a lawsuit because there was no way for me to prove that I didn't just do that. So if it's not in writing, it never happened. Document everything. That was a bit of a long tangent. I'm sorry. Here's how I, here's how I go. When I move into execution, uh, I don't just jump in. What I do is I start with simple sketches. I sketch out the concepts. I sketch out the flow. I figure out the assets. And I'm doing this with my client in real time. 
So this is a sketch I actually I presented to uh, a large investment firm. And this is perfectly acceptable because they understood it. We did this together. This shows the assets that needs to be built. It shows the flow of the programs and what the people will see. Uh, and it helps clients think about missing pieces. They don't care that this isn't beautiful. What they care about is are all the pieces there, okay? Um, so this is a great tool. Just sketch it out. Sketch it out because you don't want to be spending your time and then have to rework it. Then I move on to wireframes. Here I'm looking, I'm building out the roughest possible um, uh, thing to in order to demo the workflow. Uh, I'm putting in the minimum effort possible so that the client can give a lot of feedback and, and we'll go and we'll refine these over and over again. So, and here what I'm doing is I'm looking for common pieces that I can reuse. I'm looking for personalization. I'm looking for common data that I'm reusing. So in the case of a webinar, you know, if you think about it, you're looking at things like, uh, or, or let's say an event, you're looking at the hotel name, you're looking at speakers, you're looking at times, city, dates, right? So as we do the wireframe, it's very easy to find things that you can reuse and repurpose. And so that way it speeds up the automation process for the client. So I give them a chance to really dig deep into the functionality here. Um, I have them work through the user experience before we spend time programming. Sometimes what we'll do is if we're live, we might take sticky notes and we'll just, you know, we'll tear things up and move things around and put things back and forth. But, but this, this will save you a lot of effort when you start to program. And remember, that's actually what you're doing. You're doing drag and drop programming. You are creating workflows um, that are automated. And this is hard for clients to understand because the mental model is often around, you know, websites, static web pages, brochure type web pages, or simple emails. And so this workflow and building algorithms is is just it's it's a little bit much for them. So if you can lay it out on paper like this, or you know, you let you lay out the sketch where they can do this and see it real time before you commit to programming, uh, it saves you and them a lot of time and effort. Then I start to actually build. Here I'm doing a rough test with all the stuff in there. If it's complex, I actually leave out all the pretty pieces and I just make sure that the lead flow and the user experience is working in Modic. I'm making sure that the marketing, the marketing automation platform is working the way it's expected to. Um, I don't, and I want the client to see this. I don't want to start building out a beautiful camp marketing campaign that's broken. Uh, again, that's time, that's money. So I, I build it. So as you can see, what we're talking about here is you start with super rough sketches, you go into wireframes, and then finally you're building it in the platform itself. And then when that happens, when they like it, then you can add in the all the beautiful bits and pieces, okay? As much as I hate to say this, you it, it's surprising how many consultants, designers, writers, sometimes some of them, they get defensive when they're getting feedback from a client. Um, you need to take feedback graciously. The clients need a solution. There's, they, they may not be able to carefully explain the solution that they need because this is new to them. But uh, you know, so your job is to help them get there. You're you're a counsel. You're 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 a, an interpreter, and they're not paying for your ego. And your solution may be a good one, but it may not be a good fit for them. So I counsel my students to please make sure that you take feedback graciously. How many revisions are we talking about? <clears throat> this is actually a, a really important question here. Uh, what I find is best is you're doing two or three revisions. That's a pretty normal situation if you're organized. Um, I try to get focused feedback so that it doesn't dribble in because you know you can you can happen if 
if you don't keep the client focused on the feedback and you allow them to, to give you pieces you know, here and there as you go, then there's several problems. One is you can go down way down deep in your programming and then they come back and they're like, oh, you know, and then you've got to tear everything apart and rework big chunks of your marketing program. So don't let the client keep coming back with new suggestions. Um, you, want to, you want to have defined that already. Um, but what you want to do is you want to help them to really focus in stages. So what I like to do is I break it down into more or less three stages. In the conceptual stage, uh, that's the rough sketch stage. In the conceptual stage, we can be talking about you know philosophical things like uh, the voice or the overall tone or the look and feel of the of the um, of the piece, right? So you can be it can be about the photography, it can be about the color schemes, or even you know the the fundamental thrust of the of the message, but this is the time that they can change their mind about the big stuff. You, once you get that nailed down, you want to move to the production stage where here they're looking at, you know, headlines. They're looking at, um, you know, whether it's the correct image, is that image working or not? Does the text, you know, is, is the text functioning the way it's supposed to? Is the button the right color? Is the button the right size? get that stuff nailed down, but they can't come back and say, oh, you know, I was thinking that the, the brand should maybe do this. It's too late for that. We talked about that. We've moved on. Um, and then finally, once you get that, and again, remember, communicate, document all of this stuff, and then execute from phase to phase. What we want to talk about here is um, the final stage is the production stage. Um, and in the production stage, we want to be focusing entirely on proofreading, checking our links, checking our data flows, and so on. Uh, I'll give you another example, which is I had a, uh, a marketing manager one time that was notorious for not being able to make up their mind. And in this case, it was for a large event. This was not marketing automation related, but it was for a very large event. We had trade show booths, we had printed material, and um, I got a phone call while I was on vacation and the, the brochures are out on press. And the, the marketing manager thought, well, I don't know that we got the tone of the brochure right. Can we rework this? And, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, that would, be, that would be just a disaster to try to back this up because he was unable to make decisions at the right time. So I really spend a lot of time trying to guide my clients to, uh, to break this down from a conceptual stage. Conceptual stage, again, is this. Production stage, which is more or less this, where you're really nailing down all the details. And then finally, you know, building the skeleton within uh, the marketing automation program so that you can see the flow. Once all that is done, they should be checking uh, the, you know, the proofreading and the links and so on. I hope I don't sound like uh, I'm not putting my clients down in any way, but this stuff is very difficult for them. Marketing automation is an entirely new uh, industry and a new discipline. And I find it's difficult for people to understand it. I, you know, some people, they get it and they love it and it's really simple. But some people, they really struggle. So I, you have to help contain that um, and break it into chunks that, that they understand. And that's what we're trying to do here. So I don't mean to be condescending in any way. Now we start to talk a little bit about politics. So in this case, you know, and again, we're talking about larger corporations and so I find that there's so much change that needs to happen with marketing when you start to build marketing automation, that executive sponsorship is the key to access to success. Um, sales and marketing executives have to agree. Data, you know, to get good to get good reports, you need good data. To get good data, you need a consistent leads 
to work consistently. Data requires consistency. Salesforce, you need to convert leads to contacts and opportunities a certain way so that they get linked, that you can get marketing attribution. If you break those links, or if salespeople are working on spreadsheets instead of putting stuff in Salesforce or the other CRMs, you will not get the data that you need. Salespeople are very busy. They want to close sales. They don't want to change. They have their systems worked out really well. And um, what I find is that salespeople are often motivated by financial incentives. And so the executives who are able to tie compensation to working leads properly within the CRM are the ones who have the most success. Um, the cleanest data that I find comes from companies that they link sales pay with documenting stuff within CRM. So I can tell you that the cleanest ones, if, if your bonus depends on you logging activity, uh, if, it, if it depends on you logging your sales calls or log, you know, sending an email and logging that email, you're going to do it because you don't want to lose that commission. Then you're basically working for nothing because you're not following the rules, right? So um, the companies that can't do that are the sales executives or the executives aren't really on board. They, they're not, they can't be bothered with this. They just don't have the political will to do it that's when I find those are some of the messiest companies to work with. Additionally, <clears throat> don't hide behind technology. I find that the worst situations are when marketing and marketing operations are afraid of sales. Uh, they don't want to have difficult conversations because it's uncomfortable. Remember, salespeople are highly competitive. They, you know, they have to be able to take no for an answer. So they are pretty tough. And when sales gives feedback, um, you know, some people, some marketing teams can be intimidated by sales teams. And so they read this as bullying, as complaining, whatever. But that's actually not the case. Salespeople want to get good leads. They're going to give you the feedback that you need. You may not like to hear it, or they may not give it to you in a nice tone, but the reality is um, they are giving you that so that you can, you can modify your rules so that you can feed them better leads, okay? Um, you can't make, you can't use technology to fix bad behavior. What I do find is that in many cases, some of sales teams, they, they just get to do things their own way. And so what happens is um, marketing operations will make exceptions. They'll, they'll build workarounds so that sales doesn't have to change that behavior <clears throat> because sales has always been doing that. And going back to executive sponsorship, if the sales executives allow them their own private way of doing things, then your data is not going to be any good because they're not working the leads the same way other ones are doing. And if you're trying to make workarounds to compensate for that, what happens is you're going to get an increasingly complicated system, which becomes extremely difficult to navigate and extremely difficult to troubleshoot. So my suggestion to you is first, get executive sponsorship, have make the difficult conversations that you have to have and don't try to make technological workarounds to compensate for the fact that a few individuals don't want to work the way that it needs to be done. You're just going to create a more and more difficult mess for yourself and for anyone who comes after you. I suggest you start simply when you're implementing marketing automation. <clears throat> I suggest you practice incremental formalization. There is a management le legend. Uh, there's a legend in management circles that talks about the fact that Stanford University had a new green space in between a quad in between, uh, you know, buildings and classrooms. And most of the times when you go to a university, you'll find very perfect straight paths 
Uh, and then there's areas where people, students will cut through. So Stanford didn't pave for the first year. They left the space completely open and green. And what happened was people, they let people make their own path. And then eventually pieces of the grass were worn down. And so the, the paths that were worn down, that's where they paved. Because rather than trying to force people early into what their idea of a good path would be, um, they allowed people to choose their own paths. So how does that work with marketing automation and Montic in particular? Complex systems can seem really great on paper and they're fun to make, they're fun to design. You think about all these buckets and you think about all these rules and where someone's gonna go and someone's gonna go here and if they do this, they'll go here. And you, and you create this really complex system as you, know, you can have sales paths that say, okay, so these are 10% uh, estimate, there's a 50% and 90% estimates and, and you, know, you can create all these things and then you create the rules that go there and then it feeds into here. But the reality is when you turn on that machine and you start to work on it, things fall apart quickly when they're faced with reality. So um, what I do see when that happens is those programs, those complex programs and complex reports and all these data appending programs, they may run for years, but they're completely ignored because it, it's not relevant or people don't trust the data. And that creates a lot of overhead. It creates a lot of processing issues. And more than anything, it generates a lot of noise and a lot of garbage data that people just have to look past in order to get the information that they need to do their job. So my suggestion to you, start really, really simply. Incrementally formalize your systems, incrementally improve your systems, but make Modic work perfectly. And make Modic work perfectly before you go buy new toy tools, before you buy new tools, because I see a lot of times that people have a fairly broken automation system, but they'll just keep buying things to add on. They'll buy, you know, they'll buy Domo, they'll buy Tableau, they'll buy Sendoso and this and this and this. And there's two things that happen. First, it's very expensive to do this. Then you have you have like 15 different platforms that you have to uh you have to maintain at the same time, but they're all feeding into the central system. And when they're doing that, sometimes if you don't have it well programmed, they're competing for data and they're competing for to process that lead and you create race conditions. And, um, and then there you some companies will build more complex workarounds in order to, 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 to fix that. And so you just, you're creating this big ball of complexity that you can't unspool. So start simply, build over time, improve things as you go, and you know make your central modic system work perfectly before you add new things. Okay, again, you're beginning with the end in mind. You're beginning with your your key to success, and then you build out from there. One thing that people underestimate content, they often underestimate content needs. Content is the fuel to marketing automation. Um, what I see is marketing automation is an extremely hungry beast that you have to feed regularly. Prospects expect consistency and I, you know, but it also has to be extremely relevant. So what I see happen a lot is that people will create a few pieces and, and clients, well, our customers will get one, two, three, five pieces, and then they get nothing, or they get nothing for three months while the, while the marketers are building new pieces of content, or you know, they get forgotten in, in some engagement program way off in the side. And then marketers are asking, well, why aren't I getting the leads that I need? Because you're not communicating, you're not, you're not, you're not having a dialogue with your customer. Uh, and it's a very inconsistent experience for the customer. So feed the beast, have a lot of content up front. There's lots of places that you can look for content within your, within your company usually. There's, there's libraries of stuff. There's engineers and, and technical resources have a ton of stuff that they can give you that you can repurpose. Sometimes what you wanna do is you wanna take a big piece of content, let's say you have an ebook, and then you break it into smaller pieces that you feed over time. Uh, so you can have multiple emails that point to different parts of the book, and it's always pointing back to that ebook. 
So you don't have to create monolithic pieces of content and think that it's going to take you a year before you start marketing automation. You can start it simply research in your company, get a good content inventory, break those pieces apart, and just keep feeding people on a regular basis. So don't underestimate the value of quality content and consider it a conversation. So you really want to put a large budget towards content. And that can be the budget can be money and it can also be people. Okay. Measure what matters. This is actually the final slide. So I do hope that you have uh, questions for me because again, no matter how hard I try, I tend to whip through this stuff. Um, measure what matters. Analysts love analytics. They, it's a joy for them to analyze things. So a lot of times they will analyze so many things that it's hard to uh, keep track of. I've seen extremely large cohort studies. They spend a lot of time calculating performance, clicks, all kinds of rates, all kinds of things. And the client, the, the executive, they, they, they will calculate and analyze things that executives don't care about. This is a problem because um, if people, if, if executives aren't reading it, then what happens is there's a lot of people who know that things aren't being read and yet they have to spend hours each month building these reports. Um, and you know, it's a burden to them. It's, it's also sort of demoralizing because they know that this is just this, nobody's paying attention to this. So you really wanna define your success before you start. What do executives care about? What are the key things that are most important to the business? Where do you find the data points that support those success measures? And you measure that and you measure only that because those are the things that your executives are going to care about. Um, so measure what matters. So if we, if we summarize, you, the things that you need to take away from this are slow down, take it really seriously because it, it mistakes are very expensive communicate, document, and then execute in that order. Don't let your clients sort of push you through because you'll make mistakes. And unlike fixing something on a website, in marketing automation, you often can't undo a mistake very easily. Uh, sketch things out, make sure that you're recording them in a good project management system so that you have a rolling document. And finally, measure what matters. Okay, so that's pretty much it for me. So I would be very interested to know if you have questions. I certainly hope you do. I'm gonna look, I have to look over here for questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screens now. All right. All right, Bill, that was a, one, that was a wonderful session. Yeah, good, thank you. My first one was a bit of a disaster, so All it's right. nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay um so we we have some we have two questions so far yes okay okay so um we have two questions two of them are coming from oliver mm -hmm. so the first one is saying what is the trick to get clients to work in this structured manner, this structured <laughs> way. So yeah. you share your secret with us. <laughs> yes, that's actually an excellent question. Um, you, I find the best thing is, so many clients won't want to do that. And clients who there are, what I do find is clients who don't want to make decisions. And that's actually pretty common. Managers often don't want to make decisions. Be, so you need to uh, you need to show them the value of, of the framework here. Because if you don't have that, if, if they can't see it, um, then, then they don't understand the benefit. And, and that's sort of like that, that sort of word salad. But what I mean by that is you can show them that if you follow this framework and you think about the endpoints in mind and you have defined success steps, 
then you tell them this, this is stuff that you can go to your executives and you can prove success here because it's measurable. Executives think in terms of real concrete measurement. They don't care about likes and eyeballs and clicks. What they care about is business coming in. And if you can show them this program created 8,000 leads and it brought in you know, 10 new marketing or sales opportunities and five of them closed, that's real value. And so that framework will, will help them do that. Is there another question? Okay. Um, all right. So um, the next question is still from Oliver. And um, <laughs> Oliver is asking, um, I'm not so sure if I get this correctly, but let me try to rephrase it. Um, Oliver is trying to know what will you be telling a customer that wants to use marketing automation to start with Multic? Um, I'm not so sure if that is. Uh, I think I could probably answer yeah, that. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, Oliver, my background is actually not necessarily in Modic. I I have I'm I'm an expert in Marketo. I have a lot of experience in HubSpot and Pardot as well. Uh, I'm actually a Marketo certified solution architect. Um, so I'm pretty deep in that world. Um, but I love Modic for many reasons, and I think uh, you know so. So if you start to talk about other marketing automation systems, Marketo uh, and HubSpot, Marketo is extremely expensive to implement um, upfront, number one, uh, and it requires a lot of resources just to get started. Uh, HubSpot scales very quickly in terms of when you start to get, HubSpot and MailChimp are, are, are marketing automation platforms that your expense scales very quickly uh, when you're building that out. Now, there are many clients who that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, where Montic really comes in, it, Montic really shines with both the APIs that th they have a super robust API that's very open, and the fact that you can scale and easily add things onto it. Now, if you think about it, um, you know some of the other systems, it's very difficult to add a plugin or you know to, to code your own plugin or to customize things the way that you need it perfectly to your examples but with Montic being open source you can go in and you can tear apart the code and you can modify the code in ways that you can't with something like an adobe product or you know a hubspot so the depth of customization and openness can be a really great selling point for that All right, great. So um, I have another question. Um, mm -hmm. And this question is saying, um, what is the biggest challenge facing consultants when they introduce the clients to marketing automation? So I find that the biggest uh, difficulty when a, when, a, when a consultant introduces marketing automation is that clients have a very hard time understanding the mental model of marketing automation. It's not like a brochure. It, um, it is, um, it's something that requires a lot of deep thinking right away. You, you know, you have to collaborate with uh, a lot of teams that you normally don't. You have to collaborate with sales. You have to collaborate with sales operations, sales force, maybe programmers, IT. These are things that you don't normally have to do. Uh, as a marketing manager necessarily. And so it can be intimidating. And then I do find that um, there's a real difference between the people, there are some people who get it, there are some people who really struggle to understand marketing automation, and there are some people that they just will never get it. You know, it's just so complex for them that that um, they they just they just can't, wrap their head around it. So the first two are very easy to deal with because the the ones who get it quickly 
you know, you can just show them the system and then they run free and they're great. And then there's a second level, the second level, they tend to make very complicated systems or they, they create a lot of custom workarounds. They create a lot of custom fields rather than thinking about how can I repurpose what I have? And when you start to add that in, then you add it, you know, or, or what they might do is they might they might categorize things to this incredible degree so that, um, you know, you're, you're talking about, you have things that are fo- filed, you know, 10 levels deep. And each time it's going to be difficult for somebody to decide, do I want to put it here? Do I want to put it here? Do I want to do this? Do I want to do this? And then the cognitive load becomes really overwhelming. Would you sell marketing automation Uh, companies of any size? Um, Yes. Sorry, I jumped in on you. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. No problem. You can go on. That is a really awesome question. Um, That's a really interesting question. And that's where Modic is really great because as a, as an individual or a small company, like a solo, what do they call it? Solo entrepreneur. Uh, you know, you can get a lot of leverage out of Modic in a way that you can't many other uh, systems. But uh, I think I, I can tell you that I have some companies that are, I think I, I have some teams that it's, you know, an individual marketing manager who's running it. There may be like 20 people. It's a startup. And then I have some companies that are thousands and thousands of people. Um it's really, it's a question about your commitment to getting that content. So in order to feed the hungry beast, you could have like an individual who, uh, if you are continuously working with freelancers and you're continuously on company on, you know, Fiverr and whatever else, and you're, you've got writers working for you and you've got designers, it's really easy to feed that beast. It's more of a mental model than it is necessarily a physical size. Uh, I had a I had a talk earlier in the day on um, you know on some of the roles and, and and the 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 people that are involved with with different you know demand generation uh, uh, programs, but I think you know the more complex they become, then the more chances are you're going to need people. Okay. All right, so I have one more question. Um, We don't have um, one more question from my end. And the question is, um, how does someone new in the field get consulting clients? Yeah, good question. So if you are new to marketing automation and you want to build a consulting portfolio, one of the strongest ways that I can suggest is you work with volunteer groups or nonprofits. I'll give you an example. Um, I had a nonprofit rowing club that needed, um, that they bought marketing automation and Salesforce and they needed it configured. And you know, a typical, cost, uh, typical consulting firm wanted to charge them a lot of money that they couldn't. So I built out their system for them, which gave me a lot of experience. And uh, in return, they donated boats to my daughter's high school rowing team. So that worked out really wonderfully. But more than anything, I had a portfolio piece. Um, In addition to the portfolio piece, what happens is, if you think about it, all of nonprofit organizations and volunteer organizations they are usually run by people who are volunteering. They're often managers, you know, executives at other companies that they just do this. Uh, and then they talk, they appreciate what you did. And so they will recommend you to other people. And that's one of the surest ways that I've found to get, uh, to build my portfolio and my client base is by volunteering. Not only that, it feels good and um, it helps out your community. So. I strongly suggest you think about that. All right. So um, thank you so much um, for your time today, Bill. Um, it's what it's really a very impact, impactful session. So uh, I'm sure there will be some people that would like to have a one-on-one discussion with you. So if you don't mind, you can just go to the networking section after this. 
and then you can just um, be able to take one or two more questions from people that have advantage in your session. Um, it's really been a wonderful time. Uh, okay, thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. And then enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.